Welcome to the first episode of Builder to the X, a series where early stage founders share the wins and challenges of their first year building in Web3. So today we'll hear from three of the founders of Learn.io. Really, the thing that impressed me the most about these guys is one, their close bond of friendship with each other, and then two, the willingness to get in there and try to build businesses without the need to feel really like ready and to learn what they need to know along the way online as they go. It's a great story, hope you enjoy. We grew up playing soccer with each other, and I, so I'm the oldest. I just turned 27. Uh, Carlos is 25, going on 26, and then Augustine just turned 25. Augustine, here in this town, he's like a legend, you know? Um, every time, everyone wanted Augustine in the team. He was like, hey, Augustine's going to come play with us. My first memories with, with Carlos actually were... I think it was around third grade. During recess, we would always play soccer. And then we transitioned to middle school. This is when we knew, in hindsight, it's clear that we were going to be marketers because I would tell Carlos, like, look, Carlos, like, you got to post that Friday at 7 p.m. because this is when everyone's active. You got to do this type of selfie. And, like, there's a lot of chaos in middle school, like teenagers and things like that. But I've always found myself when I was with Augustine, he was a very calm person and, and always showed that respect as, as in the friendship, which always like drove me more to be, to hang out with him more. I think it was in the summer and Luis, we call him Fausto, everyone's last name. Fausto had um, been work. he, he, cause we were on Instagram. This is very really interesting. We were like on Instagram, just posting on our story that like we're reading books, kind of trying to be like a progressive healthy inspiration to people because most kids in our age were like partying and doing this type of uh, scene so we kind of want to be uh, from a marketing standpoint we want to be a little bit different on that and Luis was always interested so. I, I was pretty stressed out at the time and I just simply asked like hey man any book you recommend I mind you I don't read I hate reading uh, at that time and he he's like yeah man um what what are you looking for I'm like just any book bro like I was I, I don't care just any book you think and I came home that summer. He gifted me a book. And then I asked him, bro, I like what you're doing, man. I like what you're building. And that same weekend on a Friday, I, I always tell, I always love this story because this is a, a shift. We went to go hang out at another friend, Javier's house, in his garage. We were building a, a website for a client. And I, I went in. I kind of just like said, like, hey, I, I'm going to help you guys build this. I think we got there around 8 p.m., we went to go have Wingstop at like 10 p.m. And we stayed in that garage till about 3 a.m. The next morning I woke up. I'm like, this is it, man. Like, I'm I'm grinding. I'm going to grind. And that was it. That was history. So we met playing soccer. But that night was the time where we were like, it, uh, like, just it happened on its own. It wasn't like, hey, I'm sticking around, guys. Like, I'm your new friend. It was just like. I love I love this shit. Excuse my language, but I love it. My mom, being a, a single mother raising two two kids, um, she started from her house baking uh, cakes and doing jellos for parties, and eventually, she uh, branched out to opening her own bakery. And to uh, to this day, it's open. So it's been twenty two years, um, and that she always gave me that spirit of like, hey, like you can do it by yourself. Um, if you want to do something then think about it have a vision and then pursue it and that's where i i got i i would say i got my like entrepreneur like spirit it was mostly from her because she was always my back my backbone to this day and when i had pitched her about hey like i'm thinking of dropping out but this is my plan uh this is what i'm willing to do and she's like hey i i i strongly believe that she was more she believed in me so she gave me that leverage and i'm i'm blessed to say like hey like i had the support of her and for me to continue the journey and which led all the way to having a couple of ventures to having now to being a founder now and being I, I being the person that i am today uh for context my parents were entrepreneurs in a sense the bouncy houses the jumpers the inflatable uh, for parties yeah so my parents um with be being immigrants they kind of had to find ways to earn a little bit more capital so 
they started that little business for the weekends. And when I was young, I would go help them out. So I definitely think that instilled the entrepreneur principle in me. My first entre entrepreneur taste was in elementary school. I would sell lollipops. And that was like, oh, like I kind of have a little bit more autonomy than I think. And it's a spectrum, but I think exposure will get you to the point of saying like, oh, I can do things a little bit more sovereignly. And from there, it's like, okay, do you want to be an entrepreneur at a smaller scale or do you want to be a full-fledged founder and take it that route? Confucius, he says, you live two lives. Your second begins when you realize you have one. So I clearly remember when I was in my late teens, around 17, where I, I grew up more down the route, like, oh, I'm just going to get a normal job, maybe go to college or where we talk about often, like most of our friends didn't go to university. And for whatever reason that may be, but we, well, when we were at that point of our lives, I clearly remember when I had my full positioning to focus on education. And when I started dedicating and making education my priority, my life changed completely. Like education became my bridge for aspirations, dream, and having to dedicate my life to educate, to build a better future for myself and kind of seeing how it made me be a foreigner, even in my own community, own friendships, even within myself at, at key points. Um, I felt that education was the one core essence that really changes oneself, but also collectively is like the fabric of society. So I was like, education is one of the most important things, but a lot of people from specifically our backgrounds don't give it that relevancy. So one of the key things that we start focusing on is like, let's make education cool in the sense like it's the most important thing that you could possibly do for yourself. It's not that hard. The internet's there, information is commoditized. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to progress and flourish, but um, socially uh, getting that contrast to even get the awareness of awareness to want to do so, it, it's a pretty challenging thing. And more than anything, it started individually. Like Carlos said, our friendship starts to evolve and little by little we're like, hey, like, what we've experienced individually, it's actually a macro pro process and problem that we can create a product. And then we got further into tech and then like, you, we can build software around this. For me, on my side, I was really into videography and photography, which uh, I started to learn. I started teaching myself uh, how to use these software editor editing um, applications, which were like Adobe and Photoshop. And then within there, it was just, I noticed that it was everything on YouTube and I necessarily didn't have to go to college and basically take the structure of learning these individual softwares. And it was for me my time where I can take action and basically start uh, deploying these videos and then or or these uh, pictures onto my Instagram. And from there, uh, we were really close to to the to the to the point where we would basically hang out at Agustin's house till like three in the morning, talking and just sharing what we had learned from either books or from like new software things that we that we integrated into our development and we were like hey um what if we put our skills together and we start building and that's where our first venture came out which was the digital marketing and uh we were we dived in there we started to look in, into courses on youtube and and basically figuring out how we can get this up to the ground ground up and start basically going to businesses in our small local town which uh were to first was restaurants then gyms then then um bakeries everything yeah restaurants <laughs> and uh from there we started getting a team together we did relatively well i would say for our age but we we hit the scale and then we're like we need to do something where we're not limited to our peripheral house are too small for us to scale to the next level so then we heard about e-commerce uh just running facebook ads to a product and then uh the beauty of it was like we could ship it globally so that's where we took it a step further on in the digital marketing we actually started getting some good results where we were like 19 20 at the time and keep in mind our parents were saying go to university follow the pathway and we were rebellious and say no like we want to do something else we believe in it being completely naive um now in hindsight like that was a huge risk but it, it all works out for the story um so when we're 18 19 we started getting results 
and this was a shift in our parents feeling like oh like okay these kids are up to something it's working uh in terms of, like we were generating a decent amount of revenue uh at, at early stage and then this is the e-com maybe golden era where things were shiny everything's going we're scaling and then uh everything crashes so this is where our business model wasn't as effective being an inexperienced uh company and team there's a lot of holes in the business and this is the the part of the story where we went through a an internship um we since we're close to silicon valley there was this great program called europe always give them credit that they help individuals with uh different backgrounds for more diverse uh backgrounds break into tech um so there's a friend of ours that started working at ebay and we're like hey how'd you get a job at ebay and he said oh this program so long story short we looked into it and we found out that we can get some internships in tech and this was like our answer because we had a business but we didn't know how to scale it or really operate it so i remember thinking i want to see how the inning the inner mechanisms of a big company look like so through this internship that was like the universe thing here's here's your answer or here's your wish um i interned at google carlos interned at ebay and that is a key part of the story that we got exposure to software tech uh venture uh, companies and we're like okay uh we were there for six months after that it's like we we saw the world of software we've been entrepreneurs before um we can start focusing our energy to build a software-based company and this was uh the introduction to learn.com our ad tech platform in 2020 and then that's where uh we first really started taking the flywheels into ad tech we all know that tech is highly scalable and good products impact people's life and we had a, all a common thing um we we don't have a formal uh certificate of education so it's like well I think education is something that we're all passionate about. We we all read. We all educate ourselves. And that's where the idea of Learn came. Tin actually, uh, I remember him showcasing his notes to us. And he's like, guys, I have an idea. I wish YouTube was made for learning. Like, I, I, I really had, like, a personal dislike of the algorithm because the algorithm would try to give me, like, music videos or something distracting when I was trying to learn things. Like, I told Carlos and Luis, I'm like, what do you guys think of... We just kind of design what YouTube does, but we optimize it for, for learning. He asked me, he's like, hey, man, uh, you want to come on board? I'm like, dude, you say less, man. We've been building stuff since for years already. Like, let's do it. Now this is the real fun part. Carlos, same thing. No hesitation. And So being young and naive, we didn't know like how gargantuan of a platform that is. So this is where we just looked into cloud computing uh, or cloud services, I should say, like, how do you build the YouTube? I remember literally like, I don't know how to code. Like, what do I need to do? So that's when I started learning about cloud services, um, learning about you front end UI UX, having servers. And to our surprise, like, like it was a good product. Like we, we did a good job in my opinion of creating a platform. And then more than anything, we were getting users. Like we reached 10,000 users within a couple months. But the thing that killed us was the business model. Um, if you're going against Fang, they're called Wild Gardens because they own the advertising uh, business world. So our model was to run ads onto the platform and we're at the point that we're scaling, we're about to break even, but then we get banned from Google AdSense, which was the ad provider for, for ads on the platform. And then we're like, okay, like our business model literally is crushed because Google AdSense is the key partner. Like, and we try to appeal the the response, but they didn't even let us know what we had violated in terms of policy. So our product was growing, but what are what are we gonna do? And then uh, Luis, he's like, at the time he was looking a little bit into NFTs through um, Top Shot. He told me about NFTs, but I, I just viewed him kind of like a speculative, like, oh, I'm not really into basketball. I mean, I kind of get what they're trying to do. I think it was uh, the lightheartedness of NFTs when we first discovered it. It was really fun. And now there's like, oh, cool. There's art. There's something on chain. So we learned about um, keeping or making data go on chain. And that was the evolution of we had been building. What we're actually building is like an internet 
education system where they create their profile. It has all the data that they need to display they're educated, but it was all on web too. So then when we found out about blockchain in specific to send data to a wallet, like that's it. A wallet on web three is like a passport. Once the wallet gets data tied to it, it's not siloed to databases. Like when you make an account in web two for Facebook, your data stays in Facebook data uh, databases. When you make an account on Twitter, your data stays on uh, Twitter databases. But with Web3, you make an account, you get your data for whatever platform, it sticks to the wallet. So then whenever you go to another platform, as long as you got the same wallet, you're carrying that data. So in the terms for education, like we need to get, we need to be the platform that provides the infrastructure to get educational data to the wallet. And we started thinking, well, NFTs are some sort of certificate why don't we do this in the education side? And that's when we kind of came across uh, what's now known as soulbound tokens. And the goal is we want to build this infrastructure to verify education on chain. Uh, since wallets are the new vehicle of identity, we want to be the platform that provides that infrastructure. There's one specific question we always keep at the forefront. What does it mean to be educated? And it's not a question that I think we could answer with just um, simply, right? We could elaborate on this for hours, days. And I think it's ever evolving. So we keep that at the forefront. And the main problem that we're trying to solve is merit of the education. Um, as we know, the internet changed a lot of the dynamics of how people socialize, communicate, and now learn. Fast forward in the last, you know, let's say five years, things have accelerated even more. For us being internet natives though, we know that information is very open. Um, and, and that's what we wanted to do. How can I go to apply for a job and feel confident in what I know because I scaled a company and I, I want to be, you know, head of sales for this uh, fashion brand, but they're requiring me uh, a, B, a, a marketing degree. I don't have that, but I know how to sell. I, I generate six figures. How can we prove that? We were early enough to say or get the exposure to say like we can educate ourselves online and then we can build around this. It's still the alternative path, but point being we believe that autodidactism could become like a more mainstream alternative path. What's missing to this pathway is like a really strong system. Like there's no alternative system. And what started off from just us kids educating ourselves, like, oh yeah, let's go pitch businesses, run some Facebook ads, get more clients. And then it evolved to e-commerce. And then we start progressing our skills further. We're like, you know what? We didn't have any signal to say we're educated. Like Carlos said, he's a self-taught dev uh, and he has a skill set to ship smart contracts, switch networks, and basically be a robust blockchain developer. Um, I had my skill set in my area, at least in his. When we were early in our career, it was very difficult to signal that we we're competent. Um, it's already hard enough if you go to like uh, academia, if you have a bachelor's degree or master's, that's your top line signal. We didn't have that. People around the world kind of have a similar story where they want to take an alternative pathway, they want to educate themselves online, and they want to build skill sets or get some pipeline for employment. And if we can build a system around this, then we can do a macro solution to the world. The end goal that we want to create now is to really create this alternative system pipeline that can be verifiable that this person has a knowledge. And more than anything, people can trust it with it being on chain now through the data being on chain uh, i can trust this alternative pathway we call it as credentialing as a service and that's kind of where we're at right now is how do we how can we verify people's education with curriculum that's already built so our first low-hanging fruit was uh we called it proof of knowledge right you can claim something based on a on a short assessment or quiz and then we wanted to introduce proof of skill what can you build with this acquired knowledge now we haven't gotten to that point yet and the, the last point was pretty much public sentiment. You know, uh, how can we make the public feel that this is a valid form of credentialing, which is the hardest part. Our main goal at, at that point is to, well, how do we provide value? And most of it is, right, how can we, how can we fix the education to work, workforce gap, right? How can we issue these credentials to a temp agency instead of saying, send me your resume, show me your wallet. Show me your wallet and let me see what you've actually spent doing and time, right? Um, oh, awesome. You got this credential. Uh, you've done these results. You have proof of knowledge, proof of skill. 
uh, you're a very great candidate. So things like that, that's, that's what we have in mind as well. So I think YouTube is a good example. We're still carrying the YouTube principles that YouTube this, uh, created an algorithm that basically built around KPIs for whatever they were looking for. And th in this case, it's uh, consumption. So YouTube looked at all the metrics that led up to videos um, that would make a user consume the most, whether it's click through rate, watch time, engagement per video. And the end product was that whenever you look up a video on YouTube, usually the top results are the best of the best. In this case, it's for consumption. What we want to do is a similar philosophy that we're not essentially dictating the quality of the quizzes. Rather, we will build an algorithm of KPIs to dictate um, the best choice and selection for the users. And once that quality of algorithm gets uh, vetted out, the best displaying results will um, be allowed for the users. Let's say that there's five quizzes in Python development, right? Since anyone can create a quiz, the market uh, and our users will give us feedback on which uh, quiz would be the best. If there's five options, but there's one option that has a lot of reviews or there's a lot of um, positive sentiment around it, this is a signal from the market dictating, okay, this quiz of the five options is, is the highest signal. Then the employer will say, okay, in order for you to apply for this role, I need you to have this quiz, which in this case is the, the best signaled uh, quiz. At the end of the day, the, the certificate is only one piece of signal to represent proof of knowledge. But if we have like this granularity uh, protocol system, then it gives power to the employer to say like, all right, this is specifically what I need. I know that these signals may be limited, but the fact that I can tailor it gives uh, more, more control to them. The employers are busy, like they have a full-time job. Having to hire someone is a micro job in itself. So they're going to look for shortcuts and like I said, the heuristics and patterns that they've already seen. So if we take the heavy lifting for the employers to say, look, like this is an alternative system to get you quality candidates. We're doing all the heavy lifting. You just got to show up and decide for yourself. Like a lot of the pain points of taking the alternative path is not being, not given the opportunity to present yourself. So if we give these individuals at least opportunity to get the spotlight, and if they're truly competent and they know how to dance in this professional game and deliver and signal that they're going to be a good candidate, then we did introduce this alternative pipeline and hopefully everyone's happy because someone got a job. The employer uh, took a quick and easier, probably much cheaper route to get a quality candidate. And now uh, we're proud to say that if you go to learn.io, you're able to take a quiz, uh, connect your wallet to, on Polygon, and if you pass, you're able to claim these tokens. Uh, we have tested it just like on base. Um, we're wanting to do it on Phantom 2. We have ex exciting news on how we can expand and become cross-chain compatible so other users from other different uh, communities can come experience the the uh, how Learnio is able to distribute and give these tokens to people who take these quizzes. One of the highs is being being builders from a small town, and you know when you go to places and meetups and just getting recognized, it almost feels like, hey, I'm wearing a crest. You know, I'm wearing my crest. This is me, but I'm also representing, you know, my people. You know, we come from a small town. Being proud of where we're from. And not being like so like, man, I can't believe we're from here. There's nothing here. Rather, no, we what if we're the first pioneers of introducing like tech and now with blockchain and AI coming in play, like what if we are the first ones to help pave that way? You know, we don't need to be the face of it, but what if we're the first ones? And I think there's a lot of pride in that. I noticed that my upbringings, my culture were very foreign to this game that I want to participate, which is this specifically venture backed business world. So all of these patterns, this cultural behavior that I'm used to was very different from this new environment that I was exposed to. Like when I was meeting with VCs, when I was going to tech events, even my internship, uh, very few Latinos. Uh, and it was just a stark contrast from uprising where I definitely felt I was in the middle where I'm not 
um, like Mexican enough to be fully Mexican, but I'm not Western enough to be fully Western. And it was a dichotomy of like, where do I stand? Specifically like academia, how it originated from like Europe, migrated over to the East Coast and uh, the history of education being a little bit more esoteric. And from my traditional upbringing, like my grandma uh, would have to like walk a couple miles to get water every day when she was growing up. So uh, being like, that's what two generations apart, it's a whole different world where most of the people in venture would have a background where their grandparents went to whether an Ivy League or just some reputable school or just school itself, where we're kind of coming into different playing fields. Um, our starting point's different, but this is why I'm, I'm a big believer at education that it doesn't matter where you come from, you can reach the same end point if you're educated, if you're competent enough. And if the world is meritocratic enough, you will, you will be at the same point if um, effort and value are put there. One thing that in the immediate future that we actually just discussed recently is how can we incorporate, I know there's a big topic right now is AI, right? I mean, you see Dolingo incorporating AI to have like a personal assistant, right? You see Khan Academy implementing AI to have these ongoing learning experience to be deepened, right? So I think that's something we're going to experiment with is finding ways um, to incorporate AI for learning experiences. Um, now, I know right now anybody that says AI, it's, it's very trendy, it's very cool, and and we, we want to find a way where it's like, look, this is this is what it means to be educated in the modern world, you know? I'll, I'll say this. One thing that I've learned from being a founder is you have to be comfortable with the unknown. You have to be okay with, with kind of using the resources at hand and figure it out. And the anxiety comes from just like, well, I don't know this area, not that I don't have the expertise, rather... We don't know what the result's going to be. We don't know if we're going to win this game or lose this game, right? There is times where I, I think about, like, dang, like, could we, be, could we be doing more? Why why do certain things not work? You know, why are they not sticky enough? So hitting, you know, hitting ourselves in the head, like, what what is going on, like, realistically? You know, you, right now you could go to learn and, and take a quiz and get a, get a soulbound token for it, right? And why what's the value add after that it's cool to get it but then what what comes after that so just things like that and i think just breaking our head around that concept has been the hardest part but then we're fully bootstrapped we're a very small team i, I am proud of what we've accomplished and i just know that tin carlos are people that i trust with vision and i wouldn't want to be building with anybody else because i mean i i I kid you not, I'm building with my best friends. Including words for builders, I would say it's tough. A bunch of entropy and chaos is constantly happening. So if you have a vision, you're finding that. You're going to try to create order, and package, and deliver something. And that is perhaps one of the most difficult things to do in life. But give it a shot. I think we need as much innovation and progression in, in this world, specifically in this industry like Web3. We need a lot of products to get um, user adoption so that's all I have to say like it's hard but if you got that vision fight chaos package it and ship it to the world contribute um, if hackathons are a beautiful thing and I know web3 a lot of web3 companies are doing those and uh, just stay tight and keep building education is boundless and if you're curious enough and you know how to navigate that's another thing the, the devices at your disposal whether it's this or your laptop, you know, to better your life. Um, that's what we want to see. I hope you enjoyed hearing this story about Learn.io founders so far. Their site is already live, so you can go on there to Learn.io, L-I-R-N.io, and pass some quizzes, earn some alerts on Polygon. And in the following weeks and months, we'll be sharing more stories of Web3 founders building in the early stages. So you can subscribe to get notified of future episodes and you can go to venturethex.com, all one word, to sign up to be notified about more of what we have coming up at 